Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering theCUBE, New York City 2018. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live in theCUBE in New York City. It's our second day of two days of coverage. CUBE NYC, the hashtag CUBE NYC. Formerly Big Data NYC, renamed because it's not just about big data anymore, it's about serverless, it's about Kubernetes, multi-cloud. Data, it's all about data, and that's the fundamental change in the industry. Our next guest is Yaron Havi, who's the CTO of Iguazio, uh, CUBE alumni, always coming on with some good commentary, smart um, analysis. Kind of a guest host as well as a, a industry participant supplier. Welcome back to theCUBE, good to see you. Thank you, John. Very nice Love having to you on theCUBE because you always bring some great insight and, and we appreciate that, thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, before we get into some of the comments, because I really want to delve into uh, comments that David Richards said a few years ago, uh, the CEO of Wendisco. He said, cloud's going to kill Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And you know, people were looking at him like, like he's, oh my God, was just heretic. He's crazy. What was he talking about? But you might, not need Hadoop. If right. you can run serverless, Spark, TensorFlow, you, you talk about this off camera. So, <clears throat> yeah, so is Hadoop going to be the open stack of the big data world? Yes, yeah, so I don't think Cloud necessarily killed Hadoop, although it is uh, working on that, you know, because you go to Amazon, you know, you could consume a bunch of services and you don't really need to think about Hadoop. I think Cloud Native is sort of starting to kill Hadoop because Hadoop is three layers. You know, it's a file system, HDFS, and then you have sort of a scheduling yarn, and then you have applications started with like MapReduce, and then evolve into things like Spark. Okay, so file system I don't really need in a cloud. I use S3, I can use a database as a service, as you know, pretty efficient way of storing uh, data. For scheduling Kubernetes, it's a much more generic way of scheduling workloads. I am not confined to Spark and certain specific workloads, I can run with the TensorFlow, I can run with data science tools, et cetera, just containerize. And uh, so, so essentially, why would I need Hadoop? You know, if I can take the traditional tools people are now evolving and, and using, like Jupyter Notebooks, Spark, TensorFlow, you know, those packages with Kubernetes on top of a database as a service and some object store, I have a much easier uh, stack to work with. And I could mobilize that, whether it's in the cloud, on-prem, you know, on, on different vendors. And, and scale's important too, how do you scale it? Of course, and you have independent scaling between data and computation, unlike Hadoop. So I can just go to Google and use BigQuery, or use uh, you know, DynamoDB on, on Amazon, or Redshift, or whatever, and they automatically scale it out, and then you know, they'll... I That's a unique position, so essentially, Hadoop versus Kubernetes is a top line story, and wouldn't that be ironic for Google because Google essentially created MapReduce and Cloudera ran with it and went public, but they were talking about 2008 timeframe, yeah. 2009 timeframe, back when ventures were, cloud was just emerging in the mainstream. So wouldn't it be ironic Kubernetes, which is being driven by Google, ends up taking over Hadoop in terms of running things on Kubernetes and cloud native vis-a-vis -vis so, on premise with Hadoop. Yeah, so uh, people sort of tend to uh, give this uh, comment about Google, but uh, essentially Yahoo started Hadoop, uh, mm -hmm. Google started the technology, and, and just a couple of years after Hadoop started uh, with Google, they essentially moved to a different architecture with something called Percolator. Uh, so. Uh, Google is not too associated with, with Hadoop and they're not really using this, this approach for a long uh, time. Well, they wrote the MapReduce paper and in the internal conversations that uh, we reported on theCUBE about Google was, they just let that go. And yeah. Yahoo grants. And moved so, to well, something yeah, else. I'll put it slightly yeah, differently. Yeah. The companies that had the most experience were the first to leave. And I think in many respects what you're saying, Ron, is that as the marketplace realizes the outcomes that Hadoop is associated with, they will find other ways of achieving those outcomes that might be more technical. Yes, I, sufficient. there's also a fundamental shift in the consumption where Hadoop was about ranking pages in a batch form, you know, just collecting logs and ranking uh, pages, okay? The challenges that people have today revolve around applying AI into business applications. So it needs to be a lot more concurrent, transactional, real-time-ish, you know, which is nothing to do with, with the do, okay? So that's why you'll see more and more uh, workloads mobilizing into things like serverless functions, into uh, service, um, uh, service pre-canned uh, services, et cetera. And, and Kubernetes is playing a, a good role here is, is providing the trend, transport 
for migrating workloads across cloud providers because they have I can use uh, GKE, the Google Kubernetes, or Amazon Kubernetes, or Azure Kubernetes, and I could write the same application and deploy it in any cloud or on-prem on my own uh, private cluster. It makes the infrastructure agnostic, really, in this application focus. Question about Kubernetes, we heard on theCUBE earlier, uh, the VP of Product at Blue Data said that Kubernetes ecosystem and community needs to do a better job with stateful. They nailed stateless, but stateful was stateful application support, <coughs> something that they need help on. Do you agree with that comment? And then if so, what are alternatives for customers who yeah, care so about state? They should use our product, I <laughs> gave uh, Something about the database, uh, so for, maybe you're going to Before you get there, right, is Kubernetes struggling there? And, and if so, let's talk about your product. So I think uh, there are challenges around it. There are many solutions in that. I think they're attacking it from a different approach. Many of them are essentially providing some block storage to containers, uh, which is sort of not really cloud native. What you want to be able is have multiple containers access the same data. And that means either sharing through file systems, through object, or through databases. Because one container is generating, for example, uh, ingestion or of a stream. It writes it someplace. Another container is manipulating that same data. A third container may uh, look for something in the data and generate a trigger or an action, okay? So you need shared access to data from those containers. And the right- Because the data synchronizes all three of those things. Yes, because the data is the form of state. The form of right. state cannot be associated with a single container. Exactly. Which, which is what most yeah. of, you know, I'm very active in CNCF and those committees, and you have all the storage guys in the committees, that they think that block storage is the right solution, because they still think like virtual machines, okay? But the general idea is that if you think about uh, Kubernetes is like the new OS, where you have many processes, they're just scattered around. In OS, the way for us to share state between processes in OS is whether through files or through uh, databases and, and those forms. And that's really what well, we're threads, doing. Threads, inter-process communication, yeah, basically. Uh, and that's essentially, I gave uh, maybe two years ago a session in KubeCon in Europe about yeah. what we're doing on, on storing state extremely high performance access from those container processes to our uh, database that could impersonate as objects, files, streams, or time series data, et cetera. And, and then essentially all those workloads just mount on top yeah. of, and they can all share state. We can even control the access control for each individual So you feel you nailed the state problem? Yes, and we have a, by the way, we have a managed service. Anyone could go today to our uh, cloud, to our uh, website and just start trial. He gets uh, his own Kubernetes cluster a provision within less than 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes, with all those services pre-integrated with Spark, Presto, Zeppelin notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, real-time uh, utilities, serverless functions, all that uh, pre-configured on his own Kubernetes. 100% compatible with Kubernetes, no impact. It's real Kubernetes, and now to we're- To my Kubernetes investment. Yes, and what we've, uh, we're just expanding it to more types of Kubernetes threats now, it's working on bare metal or uh, Amazon, uh, Kubernetes, EKS, I think. Uh, we're working on AKS and GKE as well, uh, with partnership with Azure and, and Google. And we're also building an edge solution that essentially exactly the same stack can run on an edge appliance in a factory, and you can essentially mobilize data and functions back and forth. So you can go and develop your workloads, your application in the cloud, test it under simulation, push a single button and teleport the artifacts into the edge factory or retailer. So is that like near real-time Kubernetes? <coughs> it's a real-time Kubernetes. If you think about the kind of things we're doing, it's all real-time. Interesting. Talk about real-time in the um, database world because you mentioned uh, time series databases um, and you know you could deal with object store versus block. When you talk about time series, you're really talking about data that's very relevant um, in, in, in the moment and also yes. understanding time series data, and then its importance post-event, if you will, meaning how do you store it, do you care? I mean, it's important to manage the time series, at the same time, it might not be as valuable as other data or valuable <coughs> at certain points in time, which changes its relationship to how it's stored and how it's used. Talk about the dynamic of time yeah, so, series So first data. we sort of figured out in, in the last six or 12 months that uh, essentially real time is about time series. You know. Everything you think about real time, sensor data, even video is a time series of frames, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and what everyone wants to do is ingest a huge amount of, of time series uh, data. They want to cross correlate it because for example, even think about stock tickers, you know, the stock has an impact from news feeds or Twitter feeds of, an, of a company or a segment. So essentially what you need to do is something called multivariant analysis of multiple time series 
and be able to extract some some meaning and then you know decide if you want to sell or or buy a stock as an as an application example uh, and there is a huge gap today in solutions in, in that market because most of the time series databases were designed for operational databases, you know, things that monitor apps, not things that ingest millions of data points per second and cross-correlate and run real-time AI and analytics. Uh, so we've es essentially extended, because we have a programmable database essentially under, under the hood, we've extended it to support time series data uh, with about 50 to 1 compression ratio compared to some other solutions. You know, we've worked with the customer, uh, we've done sizing, he told us I need a half a petabyte. After a small sizing exercise, we got to about 10 to 20 terabytes of storage for the same data he stored in Cassandra for uh, 500 terabyte. Uh, you know, huge ingestion rates, and what's very important, we can do AI in flight with all those cross correlations. So that's something that's working very, very well for That's going to help on smart mobility and kind of as 5G comes on, certainly intelligent edge. Yes, so, so the customers that we have, the use cases that we apply right now is in financial services, uh, two or three main application. One is uh, tick data analytics. Everyone wants to be smarter, do deep learning on, on how they buy and sell stocks or, or manage risk. Uh, the second one is uh, infrastructure monitoring, critical infrastructure monitoring and, S and SLA monitoring, is be able to monitor network devices, latencies, application, mm -hmm. you know, transaction rates, all that. Be able to predict potential failures or SLA degradations. Uh, we have uh, similar uh, applications within the telcos. We have about three telco customers using it for real-time time, time uh, series analytics of network data, cybersecurity attacks, congestion avoidance, mm -hmm. SLA management, and also automotive fleet management, ride hailing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all essentially feeding huge uh, data sets of, of time series analytics. They're running cross-correlation and AI logic, and based on that, they can generate triggers. And if you now apply it to Hadoop, what does Hadoop have anything to do with those kinds of application? You cannot feed huge amount of data sets, you cannot react in real time, and it doesn't store time series efficiently. It becomes Hapoop. Yes, <laughs> you said that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, one, I know we, got, we don't have a lot of time left, but we're running out of time, but I want to make sure we get this out there. How are you engaging with customers? Um, you guys got great technical solution. We know we can vouch for the tech chops that you guys have. We've seen your solution. If it's compatible with Kubernetes, certainly this is an alternative to have really great analytical infrastructure, cloud native mm -hmm. goodness that you're building. Do you do POCs? Do they go to your website? And how do you engage? How do you get deals? How do people work with you? So, uh, because now we have a cloud service, so we also engage through the cloud. Um, mainly, we're uh, going after customers and leads that we generate from such events or from, uh, you know, webinars and activities in the internet, and then we sort of follow with those uh, customers. We know the specific so direct sales, sort of direct sales, but through the lead generation mechanism and marketplace also activity, Amazon, yeah, Azure. So we have we have uh, partnerships with Azure and uh, Google now. And with Azure, we have uh, joint selling activities. They can actually resell and get compensated on our solution as an edge for Azure. We're working on a similar solution with uh, Google, very focused on retailers. That's their current uh, market focus of, essentially think about stores that have a single supermarket will have more than a thousand cameras, okay? Just because they're monitoring shelves in real time, mm -hmm. you think about Amazon Go kind of applications, real time inventory management. You cannot push thousand camera feeds into the cloud in order to analyze it and decide on inventory levels and you know, mm -hmm. proactive action. So those are the kind of applications, some of them are, are So it's bigger deals, you're working on some big deals. Yes, we're not a Raspberry Pi kind of a solution. That's for yeah. uh, bigger, uh, bigger customers. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, Yaron, thanks for coming on. Yaron, he's the CTO of Iguazio. Check him out. Obviously, been great commentary. Love the, the Hadoop versus Kubernetes narrative. Love to explore that further with you. Stay with us for more coverage after this short break. We're live on day two of Cube NYC, part of Strata, Hadoop, Strata, Hadoop World, Cube, Hadoop World, whatever you want to call it. It's all about the data. We'll bring it to you. Stay with us for more after this short break. Thank you.